There are a few major milestones in a software engineer's career. Getting your first commercial software engineering job, shipping your first product, and getting your first software patent. Software patents are even more controversial than their physical device counterparts. The rather permissive environment for software patents in the 90s led to a land rush where lots of questionable patents were filed and many of them were approved. Still, being able to say that you're an uh, inventor on a published and accepted patent has a certain allure to it. What exactly is a software patent and what does it take to get one? Hi, I'm John Miller, the Deliberate Engineer. I spent the last 30 years working at a variety of places, including much of it at big tech companies like Microsoft, Amazon, and so on. As a result, I was involved in several V1 projects and lots of inventions, many of which resulted in patents. I have more than 30 unique patents uh, to my name. Today we're going to talk a bit about software patents. How do you file one? How is it evaluated and granted? What's the value of having a software patent? What are they used for? How are they abused? Is it even worth filing a software patent? Today I'm going to give you some examples of patents and inventions that I've been involved with and then help give you more of an idea about what the process is and whether it's worth participating in. Before we go any further, I need to give a disclaimer. I am not a lawyer, and I'm certainly not a patent lawyer. Any advice that I'm giving today, any information, is not legal advice. This is just my experience uh, through the time that I spent filing patents and reviewing patents at a variety of companies. If you want to file a software patent or even see if it's worth doing, oftentimes you're going to need thousands of dollars of legal advice, regardless of who pays for it, whether it's you or the company you're working for. Also, I've mostly worked in the U.S., so my perspective on things is going to be skewed towards working in the U.S. and filing U.S. patents, possibly a little bit about filing globally as a U.S. inventor. So if you live someplace else, you'll probably have to find out specifics for your area. So what is a software patent? Typically, a software patent is a description of an instantiation of an algorithm or some sort of a software invention. It'll include information about how that instantiation was created, describe the general setting that it works in, and then provide an increasingly broad set of claims that describe what you consider innovative and what you want to protect based on your invention. Sometimes a patent is broader than just an algorithm and a software invention. It can include business processes. That has varied over the years, so you need to find out what the current laws are to understand if your business logic can be included as part of the patent, as well as the algorithms that you're using. In addition to describing the invention, the claims that are included in a patent lay uh, sort of a, a claim to part of the intellectual landscape saying, anything that falls in this area is covered by my patent and I have the force of law to come and ask for damages from you or ask for you to stop what you're doing and be able to make a court agree with that. A written patent is typically anywhere from 10 pages to 80 pages of mind-numbing legalese very generic descriptions of things, ranging all the way down to extremely specific details. They are written so that they can be interpreted and enforced by lawyers. If you're curious what real patents look like, real software patents, you can go to the USPTO patent uh, trade office, I think, the USPTO's website, and take a look at both pending applications and granted software patents to get an idea about what's involved in them and what they look like. Bear in mind that if you're the employee of a company or if you're planning on being an inventor yourself, you need to be very careful about looking at patents. Uh, the instructions that I received when I was working at Microsoft was, don't look at any patents. If you have an idea, if you think it might be valuable, go ahead and submit a pre-disclosure for that idea, but don't go look at the patents. The idea is that having looked at existing patents may unconsciously inspire you or otherwise taint your invention so that you can't claim it as your own. When that happens, then it can invalidate a patent. Software patents are usually granted for a particular uh, legal domain. For example, within the United States or within Canada or within parts of Europe that are part of the EU. Europe is a little funny because the, the groups of countries that work together and honor each other's patents aren't necessarily the same as the EU, but there are a couple different patent offices there. When you file a patent application, that application gets evaluated by the patent office that you submitted it to, by an expert in that domain, or at least in related patents. They take a look at other existing art 
and take a look at the claims you have and decide whether your invention is sufficiently innovative enough for them to grant you a patent. Sometimes they refuse a patent outright. More often what they'll do is take a look at the, the patent and uh, disallow some of the claims. They'll give you a suggestion of things that need to get revised. It comes back to your patent lawyer. They revise it, you approve the revisions, and then that goes on to the patent office where that revised version gets reviewed again and possibly gets granted. The whole process from start to finish, at least in the US, can take anywhere from six months to several years. So what are patents and why are they useful? A patent is a way of protecting time and money that you spent inventing something. By getting a patent, you uh, get sort of exclusive ownership of that particular invention for a fixed period of time. In return, you agree to file the details of that invention in the patent and then after your patent expires, anybody who wants to can use it for free. The world gets sort of later access to innovative inventions and the inventor gets a certain period of time where they're granted a monopoly uh, on producing things out of that instantiation of the invention. Now for software patents especially, proving that somebody stole your algorithm, that they're infringing somehow, can be quite difficult. It takes a lot of time and money to investigate and then to apply a suit. Larger companies that have many patents typically have a set of dedicated lawyers who take care of this. But if you're a smaller company, the threat of infringing, the, of a company coming to you and telling you, oh, by the way, you're infringing our patents and you need to stop right now or you need to pay us a licensing fee. Because litigation can be so expensive and lengthy, oftentimes a threat is enough to drive compliance. A company that tries to enforce its patents and goes after people who are infringing it isn't always malicious. In many cases, they're just trying to protect their investment in the invention in the first place. In addition, in some countries, the US uh, for sure, if you don't go after people who are infringing your patent, then your patent can actually be invalidated because they say, well, the invention's already out there. In big tech, patents are used a little differently than I suspect they are for other owners of them. Typically, the big companies will have a very large suite of patents, a patent portfolio, and this will cover a wide swath of the area in uh, computing, at least giving a basis to press claims that somebody is infringing patents. So when one company is working on something and then another company comes in and says, hey, we notice that you're infringing some of our patents, the company that was accused will then bring up some of their own patents that they think relate to the accuser. And say, well, you're also infringing some of our patents. Why don't we cross license? And then maybe some money will trade hands and they each agree that the uh, other company has the right to produce software using any of the patented technology. This cross-licensing really makes sort of a club where everybody's allowed to use all of the intellectual property that each of them owns in terms of patents and uh, can do so without worrying about being persecuted. It also gives them a broader base of things to claim as uh, protection for their patents in case somebody else comes and tries to sue them. Patents can also wind up being abused. One strategy for investors with deep pockets is to go and find valuable patents in distressed companies. In other words, companies that are on the verge of folding or maybe even companies that are in liquidation. Just because a company couldn't succeed doesn't mean that the IP that they own isn't valuable. And so these deep pocket investors will go and buy the patents and then see what other companies they can shake down. Sometimes they'll go after the small and medium companies because those companies are less likely to have the resources to be able to fight the patent claim. Instead, what those small companies will do typically is, is pay a nuisance fee, a nuisance settlement that will be cheaper than even going to court, win or lose. This is what the people who buy the patents want to do. They want to collect money with a minimum of work. Or sometimes they will set their sights on a very big fish and go after them. These types of investors are usually called patent trolls. They're out there trying to charge a uh, uh, toll for going across the bridge of their IP. I, I don't really know if that's what it's based on, but I like to think it, it at least has some uh, reason for being called patent trolls. What makes a good software patent? Well, there's three basic elements that should be part of any good software patent. First, the technology should be innovative. Now, innovative can be a shockingly low bar. So you shouldn't just rule out things that to you seem obvious. That's really, if, there, if there's value to your invention, that's really something that you will want your uh, patent lawyers to figure out within the company. Don't go looking for these things yourself. So that's why you file something called a pre-disclosure that describes the invention, 
mentions anything you know off the top of your head that might be related to it to make the search easier for them, and then uh, describes uh, roughly why you think it's worth patenting. Secondly, the patent should have some way associated with it of making money. For example, if you come up with a compression algorithm that is twice as fast and compresses things twice as far as uh, other existing compression algorithms do, you can bet there's going to be a way to make money off of that, so you'd absolutely want to patent that. On the other hand, if you come up with a technology to validate strings by taking the string, reversing it, and then re-reversing it again, well, that's really just a lot of wasted work, and I don't think anybody would be interested in patenting that. Or even if they tried, it probably wouldn't be granted. And third, the patented technology should be detectable somehow if someone's infringing your patent. For example, with the compression algorithm, if you saw other people uh, producing the same sort of thing that could be understood by your compression algorithm, you'd have a pretty good idea, or at least a basis for investigating further, that they are infringing you. On the other hand, if you have some secret way of routing data that's more secure within your data center, that's not visible to any other customers, that can't be detected from outside of that company, then there's not a whole lot of point in patenting that because you won't be able to detect if other data center companies are infringing that patent. Instead, you would probably treat that as a trade secret, something which you limit the audience that can see it inside of the company and which you protect by keeping it secret rather than by uh, patenting it. While we're talking about disclosure, it's worth mentioning that if you make an invention and then you talk about it in any public forum, you mail it to somebody at a different company, you present it in a paper, you talk about it in a press release, anything like that, that disclosure, in many jurisdictions, this will result in you being unable to file a patent on that technology. Depending on the jurisdiction, sometimes uh, a patentable idea can no longer be patented as soon as it's disclosed. In other jurisdictions, it starts a timer counting that may go for, for example, a year. If you file your patent application within a year of initial disclosure, it's still allowed. Otherwise, it's just refused straight out. This technology has already been disclosed. It's public knowledge. We can't grant you a patent on it. So let's say you have a patentable idea that you haven't disclosed yet. Then you're going to fill out a pre-disclosure form that describes the patent and the value that you see in it. This will eventually make its way to your internal lawyers, but first it typically goes through the hands of managers and senior technical people in your company. They take a look and they see if they believe it's a, a valuable idea, if it is an innovative idea. These people will typically have more experience, they will have filed lots of patents, so typically they'll have a better idea of what can and can't be patented. Based on that, they decide whether to go forward with the patent application or not. Patents are expensive, as I mentioned earlier. I think the, the figure I heard for them back when I was paying more attention was around the order of uh, $25,000 to see a patent all the way through the process until it's granted. There's a budget for these things. You don't just file an infinite number of patents. This means part of the role of these managers and senior technical people is to act as gatekeepers to make sure that they leave enough budget throughout the year to be able to file all the interesting patents that come up through it. So they will say no to lots of patents that they don't think are valuable enough so that they can save the budget for other patents that are. After the uh, patent gets approved by the technical managers and the, the higher up people who are controlling the budget, then it goes back to the legal department. The legal department will do a preliminary investigation, uh, read over the pre-disclosure, read any of the attached documents, and then they'll typically meet up with the inventors at a pre-disclosure meeting. At that meeting, the inventors describe the invention to the lawyers and they sort of make sure everybody understands what's being talked about. And the uh, people who filed the pre-disclosure can also provide additional documentation, design docs, and so on, that'll be useful for drafting the patent. Then the patent lawyers go off, they draft the patent, and then they return a draft of the patent application to the same people who submitted the idea in the first place. The submitters take a look at that patent application and make sure that it's technically valid and complete. They also provide a list of the inventors of that patentable technology. The inventor list typically needs to be correct in order for the patent to be valid. So you need to be careful how you form that. The people who you put on there should be people who had a material contribution to the patented technology. Assuming everything moves forward, uh, then the patent gets submitted and maybe after a round of corrections it gets granted or maybe it gets refused. So why would you as a developer want to file a software patent? 
Well, as we mentioned before, it's kind of cool. Typically, you'll get some sort of a tchotchke for doing it, like a, a little lucite color, uh, puzzle piece that talks about the patent, maybe a different color for a patent application versus a granted patent. There's also typically some sort of a bonus associated with it. It can be anywhere from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars. So you have some incentive as an employee to file patents on patentable ideas. So what sort of things are patentable? Well, I can just tell you some of the things that I've been involved in inventing. I haven't necessarily been the sole inventor. Sometimes I've only been a, a minor contributing inventor. But things that I've been involved in patenting in the past include authentication protocols for authenticating a, a third party who can't talk directly to the authentication server, networking protocols having to do with peer networking, people talking to each other and exchanging data, shared replicated databases, discovery protocols, ways of evaluating sensor data to try and disambiguate different contacts on a, a, on a mouse sensor, all kinds of things like this. These all sound relatively fancy, but things like APIs can sometimes be patented as well. Just the actual API design, that gives people the option then of suing somebody who tries to make a replacement module using the same API. I don't know if this is still allowed today, but it was a strategy in the past. You should err on the side of being liberal when you try to decide if something is patentable or not. Go ahead and submit it. So, summing things up. Software patents are ways of protecting intellectual property, in particular instantiations of algorithms, ideally with some working software associated with it. Companies file patents to help protect their inventions and to protect them from other people who have uh, patents filed that might be infringed by this company so they can get a, a good cross-licensing deal that protects both the companies further. It can be worth filing a patent because it uh, benefits your career, it helps protect the IP of the company, um, and it can give you a little tchotchke and make you feel good. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you also need to be aware that filing patents can be quite expensive. It's not something you'd want to just run out and do on your own unless you've got $25,000 sitting in your pocket burning a hole in it. It can be quite difficult to see the process through, and oftentimes it takes years. So I know a lot of you more senior software developers out there have a ton of experience writing patent applications and patenting things. Do you feel like I've given a fair description of the patent process? What's your experience? Do you have uh, recommendations for software engineers who are trying to decide whether or not to file patents on things? I'd love to hear all about it in the, uh, in the comments below. Thank you for watching the video and keep on pushing forward. Hi, this is John. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please think about subscribing so you get notified of my future videos. Also, if you are interested, you might want to check out the video I have linked here. Thanks and keep on pushing forward.